Hello everyone, I'm Crynax, and today we're gonna talk through my Factorio Space Age review. I just want to start by saying this game rocks. Factorio Space Age gives you lots to love, little to hate, and so much more of everything. I'm gonna take a long time to go over some of the major thoughts that I have on it, but please know these are just my thoughts after only 100 hours of gameplay, and not only might I change and reform some of these opinions over many more hours of gameplay, it's also, you know, just like my opinion, man. So uh, take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> I'm also going to presume you've played Factorio before and you know what Factorio had before Space Age. I'm not going to spend too much time going over you know, every single difference between the two, so I'm mostly just going to focus on the review portion. So I want to kick off the Space Age talk with the pre-space phase, what, what you run into before you ever launch a rocket. The absolute plethora of quality of life that Wuba has added to the game is insane. Between train interrupts and super force build, bot logic, sound effects, ghost visuals, inserters being filter inserters, the quality mechanics showing up before you even get to space, uh, dozens of things, uh, hundreds maybe, that they've added, the first 10 to 30 hours that you're playing before space, or maybe more, is more fun than it's ever been before. They've just strictly upgraded the base game and they've shared so many of those improvements, even with people who haven't purchased Space Age. So I wanna commend Wuba for that. I think that's a really cool practice that they are are doing for their you know, design direction and you know, being able to provide free updates to people and not just locking it all behind Space Age. So A plus, A plus for that, 10 out of 10, the quality of life stuff is incredible. And I do think it was required, given the new complexities that Space Age introduces, they needed more quality of life to provide more margin for the for the player's brain to handle the new stuff and not worry as much about some of the old tedious stuff. Next, I want to talk about space. Uh, after you start launching rockets, which I will note is easier than before, they're much cheaper now and you only need blue circuits, they almost feel too cheap, but that's okay that they feel almost too cheap because they also don't carry very much. So I personally wish they were a little bit more expensive and carried a little bit more. Um, it's kind of absurd how many rockets you need, but you know, it's, it's not that big of a deal either way. And once you get your first space platform, you set it up to start farming space science, which is a really cool mechanic. And they introduced it kind of before the old vanilla factorial rocket would have been launched, right? Before you needed the purple and yellow science and now you get space science before the purple and yellow science and so you kind of get a little bit more choice in how you progress through the tech tree and when you want to go to other planets i do think space science felt pretty easy but that's probably a good thing because the complexity in space science is actually setting up the space platform right and launching rockets and then at that point, you've already done a lot of the work towards getting space science, which is fair because they just want you to get your feet wet setting up a platform. And I do really like that they they kind of give you an easy ish challenge to set up your first platform because you're sitting there like the chemistry dog. You're like, I have no idea what I'm doing, trying to set up the grabbers and all these things. So I think it was a really good introduction to setting up a space platform. And then, you know, you work on more science stuff, you have the choice whether you want to do more on Nalvis or you just want to run straight to the other planets, and then you need to build a platform that has thrusters on it and actually defends itself from asteroids. And I think that's really cool how they kind of had you design a stationary platform first and then move towards one that can move. And I really think it's an interesting design decision that they made ammo not super easy to ship up to space. Um, there's some light railroading there, right? Like they're saying you will make ammo in space and you'll like it <laughs> uh, because the cost to ship up piercing rounds or uranium ammo rounds are, are, is pretty prohibitive. You could technically do it with an absurd amount of rockets, but they're kind of just incentivizing you to make the ammo in space because that's their intended experience. And a little bit of light railroading, I actually think can be helpful sometimes if the game's balance isn't in such a way where it incentivizes you to do the thing that might be more fun. You know, there's that famous quote of, given the chance, players will optimize the fun out of a game. And I think that's actually a really helpful quote to have in the back of your mind, that if something is really easy to do, players are going to do it, even if it's not fun. And so making it so that the, the more fun experiences have a bit more of a reason to do them, 
you know, or you nerf the experiences that aren't as fun, then that actually ends up sometimes removing player choice, but causing more fun at the end of the day. And I think overall, I agree with most of Woob's, Woob's decisions in those spaces where they've removed player choice. I think it has been more fun uh, for the player. And we'll get into some more of those as we as we keep chatting, but I do think ammo in space is one of those. So I really enjoyed the, the space platform kind of traveling to another planet, needing some turrets on the front of it to blow up asteroids. I like that the asteroids mostly only come from the top because you don't then have to, you know, ring turrets around the entire thing. You do need a few around the sides, but not, you know, mostly just to catch a stray asteroid. So I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed, you know, the, the challenge of needing the thruster fuel and the ways that those worked. I do think the platform balance is a little weird that the width matters more than the height, you know, and so you kind of incentivize to build these tall, skinny platforms, you know, once players started looking at the formula. I hope that they modify that a little bit moving forward, so it's a, a bit more, uh, what's the word? It's a bit more reasonable in terms of how you would assume it works, right? The weight on the right side doesn't matter very much because of the way that they programmed the formula, so I, I, I hope that there might be some changes to that because it feels a little bit wacky. Uh, uh, Next, I want to talk about the planets. The, the four planets are incredible. I think they did an amazing job making all four planets feel unique. And I've played a lot of games where they, they have different planets and plan making different planets feel unique is a really tough challenge. It is not easy to make it so that they don't feel samey over and over again. And I never felt like I was doing the same thing. When I, between each of the four planets. They each felt like a unique puzzle, almost a unique mini game that you got to play. And once you solved said mini game and won that mini game, you basically had the science automated and you could launch rockets in an automated way from that planet. Usually it also includes producing that planet's special building like the foundries or the electromagnetic plants. And it just felt really cool to kind of like win that mini game and then you go home to Navis and you feel victorious and now you have this extra planet that's providing you with goods. I do think it's interesting that for the most part, it didn't feel like the player had any incentive to rebuild their Navis base in between each planet. You certainly can, you know, as with most things like player choice is there. I'm focusing more on there wasn't really an incentive to because the biters aren't getting any harder on Nalvis unless you went really early and their evolution has grown a little bit. But even then, you can take care of biters with just lasers. I'll talk more about military later, but my point is you're kind of incentivized to just roll through all three of the middle planets in a row because if you already had the resources to go to Fulgora, say, and you finish Fulgora and then you come back, well, that means if you already had the resources to settle Fulgora, you also have the resources to go settle Vulcanus now or Gleba. So there's not too much of an incentive to keep rebuilding. And I'm not sure um, if that's good or bad. I, I kind of liked that you didn't have to rebuild every time, but it also felt a little weird that I didn't touch Navis for almost, you know, 60 hours or whatever it was while I did the other three planets in a row. I kind of just left Nalvis alone. I made a few small tweaks, but for the most part, I kind of just did one planet after another, and it felt like this series of mini games, which was really fun. I do want to talk about the difficulty of the planets a little bit. I felt that they were all in a quite different space. The difficulty kind of spanned the whole spectrum. Gleba, I think, easily topped the difficulty chart, and, and I'm including Aquilo on this measurement. Uh, I think it was the only base for me and for many other people that it has actually broken after leaving the planet, right? And you have to go back and fix stuff by hand. Um, it's also the only one with enemies on it that provide an ongoing threat to your base. So between those two things, I think Gleba is easily the hardest. Aquila was quirky and I liked the mechanic a lot. I liked the aesthetics a lot, but it didn't feel particularly difficult because once you've started building those heat pipe spaghetti setups, you know, you've kind of, that's that's the only challenge. I really liked it. I just don't think it was particularly difficult. It was more just kind of a little bit of figuring things out uh, one time. Whereas Gleba is kind of this complex problem that keeps coming back to, <laughs> to provide you with new challenges even after you think you've solved them. Uh, you know, with Aquilo, it's never going to break. Once your heat pipes heated the thing, you know it's working, and as long as you keep heating it, you're fine. 
I mean, it could break if you run out of heat, but you get you get my point. Fulgora, I think, is is next on the list for difficulty. The the upside down crafting tree is so cool, and I just loved how that felt. It wasn't that difficult to get things working. I do think it's difficult if you're trying to be really efficient. So Fulgora provides a really cool challenge because the more you throw things in the trash can, AKA the recycler, the simpler it gets, but the more you're wasting stuff. And, and you know, we Factorio players hate to waste things. So I, I, really, I liked that challenge a lot. And then Vulcanus is on the so far down on the bottom of the difficulty list, it's almost laughable. I, I almost felt like I had cheat codes turned on with Vulcanus. I mean, the amount of iron and copper you get and the, the ease at which you can make power on Vulcanus with the, with the hot steam from the sulfuric acid thing, it just felt kind of crazy. And as much as I liked the demolishers, you know, they're not particularly hard. Once you, once you kill them, they're gone and now you have that space. And so it's not like this ongoing challenge. So I think Vulcanus might have been a little too easy and Glabo might have been a little bit too hard, but overall I felt like the difficulty of the planets were in a really good spot. So I want to go on a bit of a side topic for a minute, which is a hugely different thing about Space Age. And I'm actually starting to think about Space Age in my head almost as Factorio 2 rather than a DLC or expansion. And this is the fact that your base is now siloed into separate planets. And it's completely changed the, the gameplay loop and it's changed how you do a lot of pieces of the gameplay loop. And it does feel fundamentally different to me. And that it has pros and cons and different players are going to enjoy it more than others. Some players are not gonna like it, some players are gonna like it, but I do think it provides a different experience. So let me talk a little bit more about what I mean. Imagine you have your Navis base, and this is before Space Age. Imagine before Space Age, you've got your Navis base, it's a train base, you got this big train network, and you've got like a green circuit factory in one area, you've got a red circuit factory somewhere else, you've got a low density structure factory, and they're all connected by trains. And that's it, that is your whole network, right? You have these modular pieces of the factory connected by trains, and that's it. There's no higher layer to go to. But then you throw Space Age on, and now, you have to connect all of that stuff to a silo, and then that silo connects to a platform, and then that platform connects to a different landing pad, and then that landing pad connects to a completely separate base with its own train network. And, and if you think about that, that's a very different situation, because now to get an item from point A to point B, you have a minimum of four point-to-point -point transitions instead of two, right? And that, so that alone changes things. And it also completely changes something like upgrading your base. Uh, a good example would be legendary beacons. If you imagine the old version of Factorio with, but imagine it has quality, and you wanted to upgrade your entire base to legendary beacons, you just make an upgrade planner, you drag it over the entire map, and then now you can see, oh, I need 672 legendary beacons. You can see all the blinking things. You know exactly where they are. Construction bots are going to do most of the work, at least for the networks they can reach. And then you can just manually carry some or put them on trains to the areas your bots can't reach. And then you're done. That's it. That's You've upgraded your entire base to have legendary beacons. Now imagine upgrading your space age factory to legendary beacons. You can't. I mean, not all, like it. You can, but it just takes many steps. Is more what I'm saying. Like you're gonna have to upgrade every single planet separately with a separate game action. You're gonna have to get legendary beacons to those other planets, which means you're gonna have to note how many you actually need to take because you can't just, you know, construction bots can't fly between planets. And then on top of all this, you have your space platforms potentially with beacons, and maybe some of those platforms don't even visit the location you're making the legendary beacons. So then you have to have them take a separate trip to the planet you're making legendary beacons on, or you need to take the legendary beacons to the planet they're hovering over, or so, like the complexity just balloons out of control for this simple idea or this thing that was very simple in the previous iteration of Factorio. So the point I'm making with this, kind of why I'm taking an aside here, is that Space Age does change some fundamental gameplay feel of factory gaming, right? Having these siloed bases that are connected by a higher layer of logistics being the space platforms, it changes the feel of Factorio. And I just wanted to note that in my review because I don't see very many people talking about it. 
But I think it's a really relevant thing to bring up because some players like this. I think some players are not going to love this. And I, for my own review, so I'll get to my thoughts on it in a second. But I just I wanted to mention it because, you know, it's not just trains in space. It's like another layer of trains above the layer of trains you already have. And it and it can make getting items from point to point a lot more complex. I, I, I'll rephrase that. It does make getting items from point to point more complex. Like getting an item from Fulgora to Nalvis is inherently more complex than getting an item from point A to point B just on Nalvis is, right? And another thing that's more complex is buffering and lag time and debugging your factory, right? Previously, if you were, let's say you were short on Assembler 3s, you could just go look at your production for Assembler 3s. Are those assemblers running? If so, then that means the transportation isn't working right to get them where they're going. And if the assemblers aren't running, that means I don't have enough ingredients. And that's pretty much all the debugging you had to do. Now, if you were running out of assembler threes on a planet and they're coming from another planet, you have to first look at, OK, well, I don't have enough, but is that because the platform isn't going fast enough? OK, the platform's going fast enough. OK, what about rocket launch? Like, do I have enough rocket parts on the planet that's providing assembler threes? Oh, no, I don't have enough blue chips to make the rockets to launch the assemblers. Or maybe that's not the issue, but it really is the assembler producers in the first place aren't producing assemblers fast enough. And it's just it's actually really hard to debug these issues now, which, again, is a, is a core difference. And it can take more of that brain power and it is more complex. However, that being said, complexity is really fun in these games. And if it's done well, I actually think complexity is part of what keeps us coming back to playing the game. I love complex mods like Pyanodons for this very reason. So I just wanted to point out that this is a core difference of Space Age. The game does feel different and it's not just, oh, there's more recipes and more stuff to do. There is a core difference in how the game feels, and I think it's due to this siloed planet's design and the space platforms being a connecting logistics network between these silos. I do think Wuba has done a really good job making it fairly easy to automate things and do what you need to do. I think there are still some improvements that could be made. Like one thing I've thought of that would be infinitely helpful is a timetable displayed for your platforms, like a history timetable. So you can easily see, oh, my Fulgora to Nalvis loop is making a loop every 17 minutes or so. And so you can easily see like, OK, if it's stopping by every 17 minutes, then I need it to be carrying 1700 items if I want 100 items per minute. And then you can start to connect these items per minute or items per second numbers to your space platforms. Right now, it feels a bit vague and amorphous, like I don't really know how long it's taking. Obviously, I could measure it with a stopwatch. Obviously, there are ways you could make clocks with circuits, but those are all, all complex. I'd like to see the game give you better ways to measure these things yourself. I think that could help. But I digress. I just wanted to point out that there are some core differences in the feel. I Overall, I've liked them. I think they're good for the game. I think the complexity is good for the game. It does change some things. So if you're finding yourself frustrated or feeling like things are more complex in a way that they weren't before don't worry i actually think you're correct Th that is true uh it is it is a bit of a different game than factorio before space age i want to move on to something i kind of already mentioned a little bit which is the ui ux quirks of space platforms this is probably the category for space age that i had the most complaints in I'm not sure if it's just that the devs in charge of these things think differently and their, their brains work differently than mine. I don't know if I'm the minority or what, but there were quite a few times in my playthrough that I was kind of like, wait, what? That's how that works? That just doesn't make any sense to me. Why would it work that way? Or there were even situations where I was like, wait, how does this even work? I can't even figure it out. Even I'm literally trying here. And many of these moments were regarding space platform stuff and all the buttons and, and knobs in and around space platform requests and cargo landing pad requests and the, the different options you have there. Um, I There were just quite a few areas where I experienced a lot of friction. And I think, I think it needed more time to cook to make it a user experience that was pretty um, both self-explanatory, but also a situation where what you assume is going to work is going to work. And it's very clear what is working and isn't working and that sort of thing. 
for example, it's currently a pain to change requests of a platform to be from a different planet. Like if you have a whole logistics group and you want to request that from Fulgora, well, tough luck. It's all going to default to Nalvis because most things default to Nalvis and you're going to have to click and change every single one. And that that sort of thing is just not really a great experience for me. And at the end of the day, between myself and chat, we could usually figure out what the dev team was going for or why it was a certain way. But there was friction there. And what you want as a dev is for your player to get to the end of the game and you ask them, how was the UI UX experience? What did you think? And they say, oh, I didn't even think about it. I, it was great, I guess, because th they weren't even spending brain you know, energy on worrying about it. It just worked the way they thought it would and hoped it would and imagined it would. And, and so they hadn't even thought about it. That's what you want. And you don't want your players spending a lot of time kind of smashing their face against the keyboard saying, why isn't this working? Right, that's not a great experience. And I definitely had some of those experiences with the user interface uh, regarding the space platforms. So, and I know other people did too. Um, so even though many of the ways that it worked made sense, it still wasn't a smooth experience for me. So that's one of my, one of my few knocks on it was that that part, and I'm hoping they make some further improvements to that with 2.1 and future patches. All right, I wanna talk about the quality mechanic, gambling. This mechanic has been so fun for me. I have absolutely loved messing with it. Uh, it's given me a reason to ramp up production of some things that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Like if you're wanting to make rare or higher qualities of things, you really need to ramp up the production of the ingredients of that thing, or you need to ramp up higher quality ingredients for that thing, which also the fact that we have that option is really interesting. It gives a lot of interesting efficiency questions for the player's time and energy. Like if you're wanting to make, let's say you wanted to make rare logistic spots it's like well do i just re-roll logistic spots a bunch of times or do i work on making the rare parts for it but if i want to make the rare parts for it i have to do the re-rolling on those parts which is multiple situations so it's just a lot of really interesting questions and even the math of it is really interesting there's lots of lots of really cool questions about quality i think the bonuses are really strong which is good because it doesn't it doesn't feel like, oh, I could get a legendary version of that thing, but it's just not worth it. It doesn't provide a bonus. It's like, no, the legendary bonuses are huge. Even the rare bonuses feel really huge sometimes. And, and a lot of things are worth even going for uncommons because it's not that expensive to make some uncommons. So I really liked the kind of the balance of the difficulty to get a rarity combined with the bonuses of that rarity. All this being said, I do think quality has a little bit of jank to it that has some downsides. And one of the big things here is that because items of different quality don't stack, it ends up cluttering your inventory. And because there's five qualities of everything, when you end up doing rolling for quality, you just end up with so much bloat. And I just mean in the literal sense, like your, your inventory is exploded and ballooned out. Your logistics tab has ballooned out with what's inside of it because there's five different entries for green circuits and there's five different entries for red circuits. And it can start to feel a bit much when the mechanic at the core is just there to create better items, which previously was done using tiers, right? We had tier one, two, and three assembler. So, you know, I do wonder, could they have made the upgrades that they were trying to go for with quality work as just adding more tiers or types of items. I'm not really sure. I love the quality mechanic though. So from a from a design perspective, it actually felt slightly out of place in Factorio to me. And I worry that it may introduce some issues that um, are just going to be frustrating at the core that can't really be solved. However, as a player of the game who just wants to have fun, I really loved it and I had a ton of fun with it and I'm really glad they added it. So I'm, I'm a bit mixed on quality for my, my own review. The next thing I wanna talk about is the tech tree. I really loved what they did with the tech tree and the progression of the game. I really liked a lot of the technologies. I felt like they were you know, separated out really well. Most of the costs felt really fair. Uh, maybe a little bit on the easy side, but I'm an enfranchised player who, you know, has played Pyanodons and all sorts of other hard mod packs, so I might not be the best measure of that. 
I really appreciated that they didn't add a bunch of text for no reason. It felt like every single technology is one that I wanted to research and would get some sort of bonus from. And I also really liked the new productivity bonuses that they started adding to multiple different parts like steel. And it felt really cool to get, uh, you know, a free bonus steel productivity research. The research wasn't free, but free steel felt really cool to get early on in the game. And you don't have to beat the game and get, you know, the final tech to start getting some of these cool productivity bonuses. So I really enjoyed that. And I thought the tech tree was really well done. And the progression throughout getting cooler and cooler technologies felt really well done. And on that note, I felt like what they put on each planet was pretty balanced. I felt like Gleba did get a ton of awesome bonuses for being a more difficult planet, and that was nice. I do feel like the foundries and the electromagnetic plants are really, really strong compared to the bio chamber for multiple reasons, both the recipes you make inside of them, also the difficulty of using said building, you know, bio chambers needing nutrients, which are spoilable, just makes using bio chambers one step more difficult at least than the other buildings inherently. So I do think the bio chambers are a little sad to me, a little weak, but overall the bonuses that you got on planets are incredible. You know, Gleba giving you belt stacking is huge. Belt stacking is such an awesome mechanic and I've loved it. And just in general, the new throughput methods I've really enjoyed between belt stacking and being able to upgrade bot batteries with quality and being able to give trains absurd speeds with higher quality fuels, though I didn't do too much with train networks, more on that later, but I'm really glad that that exists. And so if you give them super high quality, you know, nuclear fuel, they're gonna accelerate from zero to 100 instantly, basically. All right, I wanna talk about the military stuff a little bit. I'll start by saying I've never been the biggest fan of Biters On in Factorio, so I might be in the non-target audience for some of these things. So take what I say here with a grain of salt. It felt that we got a lot of new military tools for what was a relatively small amount of new military challenge. This is another instance that feels, or that is a bit of railroading where they gave the enemies certain resistances to force you to use certain weapons. For example, missiles are needed for the big asteroids since they have the laser and physical resistance. You need rail guns for the huge asteroids because they have the huge physical and explosion resistance. And then the pentapods resist lasers like crazy, so you are kind of encouraged to use the missiles and the electricity Tesla turrets there. Railroading isn't inherently bad, but it is a bit interesting that it feels like these weapons kind of only exist because there's an enemy that they forced to need it, right? If they hadn't pumped those resistances up to 99 or 100, you could have just used laser turrets for everything. And that would be very boring, is also true. So I do think this is a case where railroading provides a, get a better gameplay experience. That being said, it also didn't leave much room for player creativity. The new weapons are really cool, but you kind of have to use them on the end game platform the way that they intended you to use them. And there's not really a reason to use missile turrets on Nalvis, because lasers are already good enough. So it felt a little weird that the new weapons kind of only had one main use that was already kind of decided for me. So, you know, I, it just felt a bit like I wanted more challenges that I could have tackled with a combination of the new and the old weapons rather than here are huge asteroids, you need railguns for them, and that's how it's gonna work. Um, that being said, railguns are really cool, and I like that you needed to put railguns on your space platforms because the way they are positioned is interesting. So again, I do think the railroading provided a good experience. I just wish there was a bit more options for all those things and different places to use them. Demolishers are actually an example of what I liked because yes, there were some really simple ways to kill them that people are defaulting to, mainly just a square of gun turrets, that being said though, you can kill them in all sorts of ways. They, they don't have resistances that force you to use a bunch of gun turrets or something else. And I really liked that demolishers could be killed in different ways. And I also really liked that, you know, they didn't just attack your base naturally, like that made Vulcanus feel a bit more relaxed, I think, which was good. 
The reason I've been biters off in most of my playthroughs is that the risk of losing, the risk of failing to defend against them, or even the risk of having not literally 100% wall around your base, is that the biters can just run in and blow your entire factory up. And that's not what I want to risk. I don't want to risk my entire factory if I fail the wave defense minigame. I love tower defense games, and I always have, and it's really fun to watch biters smash against your walls and flamethrowers and lasers. Like, that's really cool, but I don't want the risk to be losing my entire game or base. And so I really like the idea of combat almost being a separate minigame, either in a separate location or done in a separate way, where my waging war on the biters or the asteroids or whatever it is, is not risking my entire factory. And that's exactly what Wuba has given us. With, with the platform trips being in space, you're only risking your platform. And it is true that, yes, a platform kind of is a factory, but it's a very small thing compared to the factory, and they're easier to rebuild. And if you already built it once, you, you, you know, still have the means to build it again. So that, I really liked that some of the harder wave defense challenges were done in a way that weren't threatening your factory. I've actually really always wanted that for biters even and other mods that add enemies and that's part of why I really liked freight forwarding is that the enemies were on a separate island and you could go fight them on your own time. That felt kind of like how demolishers are done. So I think the way they've introduced enemies on Vulcanus and in space has actually been really genius and I have nothing but praise for that. I thought it was really cool. I want to talk a little bit about the difficulty overall. I thought the length of the game was up there. I mean, it took me 100 hours and I was I was not mega basing. I wasn't taking my sweet time. I was kind of constantly making progress. Granted, I did get distracted dealing with quality gambling for many hours, but still, I felt like 100 hours was pretty reasonable, you know, for for a time and it based on what I've seen some others say, it seems like it's taking people about 4 to 6 times longer than their vanilla playthrough would have for a similar type of playthrough. And I think that's actually really cool. Having the, the playtime on Vanilla Factorio, I do feel was a bit short, and a lot of the game was relying on players wanting to push past the end game or getting mods. But now the core experience that they're offering you has a large amount of playtime. And especially for newer players, it's gonna be maybe more, you know, there are gonna be players who are gonna keep coming back to Factorio again and again and each time they get a little further in Space Age, but still haven't beaten it. You know, because now there's the getting to launch a rocket phase, and then there's getting space platforms going phase, and then there's each separate planet, which is really cool. So I really like the length of the game. It didn't feel too long, and it also felt like it lasted long enough. The good news with it taking 100 hours, which is a decent amount of time for me, is that that whole time, was spent solving new and interesting puzzles. I never felt like I was just doing the same thing over and over again, but I was dealing with Fulgora, which was its own awesomeness, and then I was dealing with Vulcanus, which was its own awesomeness, and it just, it felt like there was always something new and different to do. I never ran out or felt like, oh, I just have to do the same thing I just did, but on a different planet. It always felt new and fresh, and that 100 hours was completely full of a fresh experience, which I, again, I am amazed by. Most games that last that long have some amount of repetition and grindiness to them, and I never felt that once in my Space Age playthrough. I think the difficulty had some good variance with planets like Vulcanus being a bit more chill and easy, and then planets like Gleba being a bit less chill and a bit more difficult, and I actually really liked the difficulty balance. I think as a player who's played as much Factorio as I have, it did feel on the easy side a few times, but it still took me 100 hours and it still wasn't that easy. So I, I think the challenge is actually pretty high up there and I'm glad they didn't make it higher. And I think there are some spaces where maybe it could have even been easier for the average player. But we'll see, we'll see kind of where that all boils down to in, in the public's eye. But I thought it was in a pretty good space myself. I want to talk a little bit about the train interrupts and elevated rails real quick. I did not use trains barely at all. So unfortunately, I don't have a ton to say here other than elevated rails are very cool, allowing for higher throughput in intersections than before. Uh, they're a welcome addition to the Factorio, uh, <laughs> you know, list of things you can build. Train interrupts are super awesome, and I'm really excited to get to play with them more and make more complex networks with them. I really didn't play with them too much in Space Age, so I don't have a ton of helpful insight here, but I, I really love the system, and I think 
at least from what I've seen online and what other people are talking about, it seems like it really is a game changer. And in a lot of spaces, people are not going to need mods like LTN or Project Cybersyn anymore. I do think there are still things those mods can do that the interrupts can't, but at the same time, you just, in a lot of situations, the interrupts will be exactly what you need, and they're, they're more than good enough. So I'm really excited to dive into this mechanic in future playthroughs. So the graphics, I think they knocked the graphics out of the park. Uh, everything is just A+. Plus. It's all feeling like it fits perfectly in the grimy industrial engineering aesthetic, even though we're dealing with space platforms and, you know, what feels like much higher tech stuff than the previous Factorio. I thought everything looked amazing and it felt like it fit the aesthetic. In particular, I think they did a really good job with space platforms and all the space buildings and just the cool animation when you build things on space platforms with the little, you know, platform like expanding out graphic. I just think it all looks really neat. All four of the planets look really good. The detail and colors on Gleba are just absurd. You know, the lightning storms and the, the Vulcanist lava, just everything was really well done with the graphics. And I, I don't play games for the graphics generally, and they tend to be more of a background thing to me, but I thought they were A+, 10 out of 10. Like, I have no recommendations for improvements. Except one thing is that on Gleba, when you build concrete, there's an absurd amount of stuff sticking up through the concrete, and I found that kind of annoying. Um, I realize there are mods that can change that, but that, anyway. The sound design was also really good. And again, I don't tend to play games for the sound or the music. I tend to not notice music as much as some other people do, but they were all great. Uh, I really liked a lot of the new music tracks. So I have nothing but praise for the sound team. They added lots of new sound effects too, to like picking up and dropping items. And I thought that was really satisfying. So the sounds for the game are great. I have no, no complaints there. 10 out of 10 sound design. The performance of the game was really great like I had zero issues in my hundred hour playthrough I know there are some things that they had to really optimize to get working properly you know they've added a lot of complex systems to the game that could reduce the the performance of the game but I think they've done a really good job optimizing it and they're going to continue to do that so I'm really appreciative that you know, for a game like Factorio, where so many players are building mega bases that are stretching the limits of their PCs, I'm really glad that the team is working on optimizing it. There are plenty of city building games that don't put any effort into optimization, which is kind of ridiculous because people are going to want to build big cities. And, and so having a dev team that actually cares about optimization is wonderful. Uh, as far as bugs go, I believe they've fixed literally hundreds of bugs since the launch of SA, and they've just mentioned in a recent FFF that they have hundreds more to fix still. That being said though, I ran into very few bugs, and I ran into even fewer bugs which actually mattered. You know, some of them were more like, oh that's a bug, but it doesn't really matter because I can just work around it or it doesn't even affect me. So despite the fact that there may be hundreds of bugs, you don't run into many, and I ran into very few. And I think Wuba has proven themselves to be one of the best bug fixing dev teams, maybe of all time. It's it's truly incredible. And, and the game is going to get to what feels like a very bug free state, I think, here in the next month or two for most players, you know, and they really work on fixing things like crashes uh, as well. So that basically no one's ever having the game crash and stuff like that. So again, major kudos to the team. I do think they launched the game with more bugs than maybe they normally would be comfortable having in their game. Um, but even compared to a recent release like Satisfactory, I think Factorio was far more bug free than Satisfactory was, you know, to the point where again, it really didn't affect my playthrough at all. I was I was able to just play the game and experience very few bugs that ever mattered. I do wanna mention mod support as a point. I think two major thoughts here. One is that Factorio in general has one of the best mod scenes of any game I've ever played. I, I think the mods offer content which truly transforms your game experience. They're not just like little like, oh, free iron, you know, like that's technically a mod, but this is, this is a mod scene where truly the game can be transformed as you download different mods. And part of this is due to Wooba having incredible mod support and actually putting dev resources and time into the game being moddable. And, you know, modders actually have, some modders have access to the game 
uh, at levels that we don't as players and, and the devs are in chats with the modders and actually changing the way things work for modders. And so there's just all sorts of ways that the team has done a good job making the game moddable. On the flip side though, Space Age in particular has added what I would call some nothing burgers for modding. Despite seeming like a gold mine, the quality mechanic, for example, has very little that mods can actually do with it. Which is really sad, because I think if you could tweak all of the parameters of it, the quality mechanic could be something that mods could use really well. For example, you know, you could have it so that many items have quality just turned off, like pipes or belts, where you just have the item. But then certain, certain things have quality turned on, like an assembling machine, but you only have maybe two possible qualities it could be. You could have normal and rare. And then, you know, what about the idea of, oh, you could have a different recipe for a rare quality assembling machine. So that way mods could go away from having different tiers for everything and they could use quality instead. But there's just so many things you can't do. You can't do anything that I just talked about with modding quality. And so as much as I love the things that they've added in Space Age, some of them are a bit locked down and not modifiable with mods. And I think some of that's for performance reasons. Some of that's because dev time reasons. And some of it's just because maybe they didn't want to, I'm not sure. But I do hope that as we continue to go, they can make some things a bit more open to modding. I don't know what's possible to change at this point, but that, that would be my hope, because I think quality is, is a really cool mechanic to mess around with. I think quality as it stands is just like, it's either on or off. And then everything can be made, all the different qualities. And I don't know, maybe there are a couple things that can be modified a bit more than what I'm saying, but I, I've heard multiple mods talk about how locked down it is, and that's a bit of a bummer. But that being said, yeah, that's just one example of something that's locked down. Space Age has added tons of stuff that mods can do. They've added far more that's not locked down, and they've added all sorts of new, you know, lines of things that mods can hook into, in other words I don't understand. And so, you know, between that and all the new assets, right, there's all sorts of new like graphics that modders can use who don't make their own art so there's only only up is the direction we can go for modding and you know there are some things that might maybe don't fit as well into the mod world but there's all sorts of new toys that modders have so i'm really excited to see where space age continues to go with with the modding community one other thing i want to mention is the value for the money i know some people were a bit uh hesitant at the 35 dollar price tag i mean my short answer is it's completely worth it and justified. The amount of content that the Space Age expansion has added is so absurd. I actually think it would justify costing more than the base game, though that would be a really weird way to do it. I, I do think it's true from a sense of what you're getting for your money. So it's completely worth it. Uh, I do think if you're interested at all in the game, you should certainly buy it. Space Age is very much worth your money. Um, no questions about that for me. So at the end of the day, despite having a few complaints about some things like UI UX or the military stuff, I really think Space Age has knocked it out of the park. It has been an incredible expansion. The hundred hours that I spent were pretty much all just me having fun and, and laughing like a giddy little schoolboy. It's been such a great time playing it and I'm really excited to keep playing it. And on top of that, mods are gonna add infinite replayability where there already feels like there's infinite replayability. So highly recommend Space Age. It's been an incredible experience and there's so many things I still haven't even done yet, like messing with train interrupts or making platforms that are their own bases in space and not even using planets. I, there's so many options I haven't even explored. And I love that about Space Age. Uh, you, the player, have a lot of agency in how you get to the victory screen. And that feels more true for Space Age than, than ever before, and I cannot recommend it enough. So, as always, thank you guys for watching. Let me know what you think about Space Age down in the comments. I hope this has been helpful to kind of give an overview of my thoughts. But, as always, I'd love to hear what you guys think. If you'd like to chat more about it in detail, join the Crydania Discord. There's a link down in the About section. And other than that, as always, I'll leave you guys to it. I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you in the next video.